There is a sure sign of the end time. Gary Stearman has written an article entitled Secular Fundamentalism. This is the sure sign we live in the last days. And Gary is here to discuss it with me. And JR, before we get into a definition of secular fundamentalism and some, some quotations from the founders of uh, uh, the groups that believe this, uh, let's go back and look at well, what are called the last days. Uh, many times the phrase last days is used in the Bible and sometimes it's thought of as maybe just the last few days before Jesus comes for the church. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to read here uh, what Paul wrote to Titus in Titus 2, 12 and 13, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, J.R., <clears throat> this letter to Titus was written about seven years before the temple was destroyed. In other words, the temple was still in full operation at that time. Mm -hmm. And still he includes an exhortation to watch for the coming of Jesus for the body of Christ, the, what we call the rapture of the church today. Now, centuries ago, uh, Paul uh, defined the theological posture of the redeemed. We are supposed to be looking up. And of course, that's been the theme of this ministry for years, keep looking up. Uh, but the Lord knew that between the time that Paul wrote this and between the time that Jesus came, lots of things would happen. There would come, come the destruction of the temple. There would come heresies. There would come the Dark Ages. Uh, there would come uh, many, many wars, uh, and devastations. Uh, nevertheless, we are to keep looking up, looking for that blessed hope. Now, people are looking for signs things that will be apparent in these last days. And I maintain that there are some, and I know you do too, but in, a, in one sense, there are no signs given for the church. That is, the rapture is a signless event. So therefore, what should we be looking for? Well, we should be looking for Israel who's looking for signs. Yeah, that's right. And it, it all boils down to the signs are given to Israel. In truth, if you, if you really want signs, you look at the Old Testament prophecies about Israel coming back into the land. And we've done that many, many times right here on Prophecy in the News. Uh, <clears throat> the church, J.R., can be said to have a, a calculable uh, duration in earth time. In other words, the church mm -hmm. is a finite body. It had its beginning on Pentecost back at perhaps A.D. 30. Uh, it will have an end on some future date as yet undisclosed. And between those bookends, there is a finite length of time. However, that time's not defined. In other words, there's nothing that you can do to predict the end point of the church. Nevertheless, many people have tried on the basis of what's happening in Israel, on the basis of what's happening in the world, and that's pretty much the thrust of my article, to show that there really is one sign uh, that these are the last of the last days, mm -hmm. and that sign is exclusive of Israel. Now, I've always considered the days to be millennial days. The six days of creation represent 6,000 years, mm -hmm. and the seventh day wherein God rested represents the seventh millennium. We have arrived at the end of the sixth millennium, and we have we have launched in human history the seventh millennium. Yes, we have. So when the, in the New Testament it talks about the last days, that's the word plural, I, I consider that to be two days, the fifth and sixth millennium. Mm -hmm. And so uh, what we're looking at here is, is not a specific uh, time uh, for the um, signs of the times of the end the events of the very end of the end. Uh, for example, in Hosea uh, chapter uh, 5 and 6, we have, uh, after two days he will revive us, and the third day he'll raise us up and we'll live in his sight. Mm. Uh, these two days I see as millennial days. So here yes. we are at the end of the second day, and the third day now has been launched, and Gary, he did raise them up. The us here refers to Israel, mm -hmm. not the church. Yes. Israel has been raised up, by the way, in unbelief. If you have been watching Israel lately, 
The one distinctive of modern Israel as it's presently regathered is that they're not placing their faith in God, but rather in man and in things called the roadmap to peace and in military uh, might and uh, um, mm -hmm. aid and comfort that comes from uh, the Western Alliance. In other words, they're not really trusting God, which is exactly a fulfillment of prophecy. J.R., mixed in with this is the church. Where does the church stand uh, relative to Israel? Uh, in 2 Timothy 3, 1, Paul writes, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. And this word perilous in the Greek is from chalepos, which means raging insanity. Well, sometimes that really is a good description of what we've got going today. However, you can really, say, on the other hand, you can say that there has been a lot of raging insanity throughout the church age. It started out that way. The Caesars were ragingly insane when they went after the early church leaders and after the apostles. Mm -hmm. uh, there was raging insanity in the second and third centuries when you had strange heresies popping up. Uh, in the third and fourth centuries at the rise of the state church, you had Augustine of Hippo who became the founding uh, theologian uh, of the, the great Roman church and uh, he incorporated all kinds of things into Roman Catholic worship. Uh, Manichaeanism, which is the worship of angels, Buddhism, which uh, is asceticism, living the ascetic life, and of course that means denying marriage. Uh, he uh, brought in Neoplatonism, which is spiritualization of Christ, saying that Christ didn't come in the body, he came in the spirit. Uh, and furthermore, Augustine changed the definition of the church, redefining salvation not as relationship with Christ, but as obeying the, the mandates of the local church. So the local church as body politic became the measure of Christianity. And J.R., that later brought uh, the conditions uh, for the Reformation. All of that is the last days, mm -hmm. as defined in the Bible that Paul talked about. The last days, therefore, are two millennia in length. So what are we to say about the last days prophetically? Yeah, well, you know, the Apostle Paul in Romans, uh, for example, the first few chapters of the book of Romans, he talks about uh, the idea that men refused to give God the glory and mm -hmm. their foolish hearts were darkened and uh, they slipped down into a secular humanism type of, um, of underlying uh, theology, if we could call it theology. It's really a, a theology, <laughs> atheism, atheism. Uh, basically. And we have had, down through the centuries, theologians who we can only call uh, liberal theologians. And their underlying uh, basis for their thinking mm -hmm. is there is no God, and we're all there is, and there is no life hereafter. Like the Sadducees, for example. The Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection. Mm -hmm. They didn't believe in angels. They basically didn't believe in God. And, and, and yet they inserted themselves into temple life and worship. Yes. And they, they were able to do so because their great political power in the first century. Really, the Sadducees believed in two things. They believed in uh, a kind of uh, respect for philosophy, mm -hmm. Greco-Roman philosophy, and they worshipped money, that is to say, the flow of wealth. And they, they found their goodness in the belief that, that uh, the highest aspect of life was to be found by channeling money from the rich to the poor, the transfer, transformation of wealth or the transfer of wealth from the upper class to the lower class. Well, J.R., that sounds mighty modern yes. in a way. Well, that's modernism it is. to a T. I mean, the secular, hum the, uh, the, the liberal theologians, what we call modernism. And, you know, it really began in earnest uh, in the, around the 1730s, something like that, early 1700s, uh, coming out of Germany when they began to question everything the Bible said. Yes. Uh, this modern theology uh, denies the miracles, denies creation. Uh, and, of course, then with Charles Darwin, everything went downhill from there. We have always had a liberal theology um, cropping up from time to time in the church. 
But in 1933, Gary, we had something happen that was a, a whole new ball game. This Actually, is the sign of the end time, don't you think? And I think, and that's my contention in this article called Secular Fundamentalism, that there is one key sign that tells us that we are there and mm -hmm. that we should begin seriously to look for the soon return of Christ. Remember the year 1933. Yes. Now, Gary has written this article for our September edition of Prophecy in the News magazine, and it deals with something that happened in 1933, something that put a whole new face on the end time. Now, I realize that the return of the Jews to the Promised Land is the super sign, but I believe this sign is most important. It was predicted in the Bible, and when the Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy, he talked about this. Listen to it the oppositions of science falsely so-called. Here it is, Gary, tell us about Well, we live now in an age uh, when science, quote unquote, dictates what we should believe. And that's the great battle today, J.R. But in 1933, uh, the Humanist Manifesto, part one, or number one, was, was published. And listen to these words, the preamble to that manifesto. The time has come for widespread recognition of the radical changes in religious beliefs throughout the modern world. This is in 1933. The time has passed for mere revision of traditional attitudes. Science and economic change have disrupted old, the old beliefs. And there is, the, in the opening words, we find two structures. We have science on the one hand, and economic change on the other. The two great forks, mm -hmm. you know, in the 20th century way of thinking. Science on the one hand said that man created himself out of the ooze of the ancient swamps. Yes. Uh, that's science. Economic change, how did that manifest itself? In social Darwinism under the heading of Marxism, Nazism, and a lot of other isms. And so here in 1933 is a declaration that Christianity is outmoded. It's time for, the, for a new system. A new system. A new system. <laughs> and J.R., here's the way it's worded. In an introduction uh, to, to this uh, uh, Humanist Manifesto, Paul Kurtz writes this. And by the way, Paul Kurtz is an atheist. In 1933, a group of 34 liberal humanists in the United States defined and enunciated the philosophical and religious principles that seemed to them fundamental. They drafted the Humanist Manifesto I, which for its time was a radical document. Well, I could go on, but notice that word fundamental. Mm -hmm. They were secular, and they outlined a group of fundamentals of their faith. Therefore, I would term them secular fundamentalists, and I think that's a very apt title. Good. All the way from liberal theology to secular fundamentalism. Right. What a switch. <laughs> what a switch. Isn't it amazing that, first of all, men do not like to give God the credit. That's Romans chapter 1. Yes. And then they, they fall from that into a liberal theology, as generally speaking. Mm -hmm. And then they, uh, according, to the, according to the slide, they go all the way from theology to atheology or atheism. And all the way from respecting marriage contracts and so on to homosexuality and to uh, the, the basis of, of uh, human mm -hmm. degradation. And then they put on these white smocks and walk in the halls of our universities and call themselves scientists mm -hmm. and uh, tell us that we came out of an ooze, there was no God. And, and Darwinism then became the religion of the, uh, of the last hundred years or so. Right. And uh, out of that then has come this basic idea is we're all there is. This is our little boat sa sailing on a sea of nothingness and uh, we must survive. Yes. It's amazing. Oh, it is amazing. And as you read uh, various uh, little uh, squibs from the uh, Humanist Manifesto 1, 
uh, you can see that they're trying to establish a religion. This is not Laodiceanism. That is, it's not heresy within the Christian church. It's right. a brand new external institution. And the, these are their own words. To establish such a religion is a major necessity at present, 1933. It is a responsibility which rests upon this generation. We therefore affirm the following. Here's the first uh, premise. Religious humanists tend to regard the universe as self-existing and not created. <clears throat> uh, here in proposition number eight, religious humanism considers the complete realization of the human personality to be the end of man's life. You're not going to heaven. Yeah. What you do, in, in fact, they use the phrase development in the here and now. Mm -hmm. None of this pie in the sky by and by. Uh, we worship what you can do in this life. Well, Gary, they also called it religious humanism. They did. So they claim themselves as a religion opposed to uh, the religion of the Bible. Exactly. They present themselves as a competing faith, if you will. Mm -hmm. And it's a faith in the human, uh, that in the human here and now, not in any hereafter. And in fact, they decry what they refer to as salvationism. Salvationism falsely so called. And, and J.R., when you look at salvation, it's the core and fundamental, if you want to use that term, belief mm -hmm. of Christianity. Mm -hmm. You know, I was watching a science program the other day on television, and they talked about um, anything could destroy this planet. Mm -hmm. An asteroid or any number of things could destroy this planet. A, a giant volcano could destroy mm -hmm. all life on Earth. And we may not survive. So they plan that in some time in the foreseeable future to put, to collect DNA like a Noah's Ark, you know, mm -hmm. yes. of humans and plants and animals and everything on the Earth and send them off, hundreds of these spaceships, send them off to, to maybe hopefully land on some other Earth-like planet and keep the human race going. And that's their quote-unquote blessed hope. <clears throat> Here's and a quote. Uh, they say salvationism, based on mere affirmation, still appears as harmful. Not, not just neutral, but harmful. Uh, the idea of being saved, they regard as a detriment. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? That's amazing. Well, let, me, let me just mention okay. one thing to you. When this guy was talking about sending spaceships to other galaxies and seeding other planets, he said, after all, that's probably the way we got here. Indeed. It's called the, it's the theory of panspermia. Yeah. Some intelligent life sent out seed into the universe, and <clears throat> it took root in the, uh, the ancient soils right. of Earth. So they're, <clears throat> they're saying that evolution really doesn't work. <laughs> I guess they are. You know? Basically, that's what they're saying. We did not evolve on this planet. We were seeded here by some intelligence somewhere. Paul's passionate words to Timothy just ring like a bell. Oh, Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science, falsely so-called, which some professing have erred concerning the faith. Grace be with thee. Amen. That's uh, 1 mm -hmm. Timothy uh, 6, 20 and 21. Uh, science, falsely so-called. Isn't that yes. amazing? What's amazing to me is scientists say there is no God, and suddenly they want us to worship the devil uh, as aliens from some other planet or galaxy somewhere. So it's, it's coming, mm -hmm. I, I, I'd hate to say it's full circle, but what they're doing is the secular um, fundamentalists, <laughs> these secular humanists, are bringing us, uh, bringing the human race down to the, the primrose path <clears throat> to accept the devil Indeed they as do. God and his son, the Antichrist. Absolutely. <clears throat> Excuse me. Let me just uh, do a, a couple of, or three quotes here from the Humanist Manifesto 2, which came in 1973. That's 40 years after the first one. <clears throat> Uh, we find, and I'm quoting, insufficient evidence for belief in the existence of supernatural. Promises of immortal salvation or fear of eternal damnation, damnation are both illusory and harmful. Modern science discredits such historic concepts. I could go on and on and on, but J.R., let me just say, secular fundamentalists are activists. They're constantly seeking ways to suppress orthodox Christianity. They're getting stronger, 
And they are a definite sign that we are in the very end of the, of the days of the church. Yeah. So this is not just last days or 2,000 years. This is the end of the end. Right. We are there. And they are preparing the world's mindset for the rise of the Antichrist and world government. Because you see, that social agenda is their only hope. Wow. We'll be back in just a moment. This is the article, Secular Humanism, A Sure Sign of the End Time. It's in our September edition of Prophecy in the News magazine. If you'd like to read this article and all that Gary has to say about it, order the magazine. Call the phone number at the bottom of your screen and order it today. Gary, thanks for this article. Well, Jr., I, I enjoyed it bringing it out, not because it's an enjoyable thing to write about, but because people need to know. And I want to just testify publicly right now that salvation through the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ is as valid now as it ever has been. It's mankind's only hope. I don't care what the secular fundamentalists say. That's right. And salvation is not available just to give you a happy life. Salvation is available to keep you from going to hell. This is J.R. Church and Gary Stearman. Until next time, keep looking up.